Peter had all the zeal, but he lacked the knowledge. Sometimes that happens to us, too. We've got a great heart to do great things for God. We're running around doing all kinds of stuff, but we don't know what we're doing. Sometimes we're doing more harm than good. Then there's the opposite problem. Sometimes we've got all the knowledge in the world, but we don't have a lick of passion or zeal. We need both if we're really going to honor God. And then to wrap this up, look at what Jesus says to Peter, verse 11. Finish it off here. I know it's been long. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Basically, sheath your sword. That's the way it reads. It's a command. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given? Now, I will, I'm going to be honest with you guys this morning. You're familiar that this is not the first time in Scripture where there's a mention of a cup uh, in the Bible. We know that um, even though John does not record these events, again, John has a different purpose for writing. But we know that the other, uh, the other writers do mention uh, in the garden how Jesus was praying, you know, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not what I will, but you will. And I've got to be honest with you folks. I've studied the Bible a long time in my life. I don't know all the answers. And uh, obviously, if you know me, you know that's true. I've only begun to scratch the surface on my knowledge of what Scripture teaches, and, um, and I, I, I honestly pray that the Lord would give me many, many, many more years of looking into the, to the, to the depths of God's Word. But from the time I was almost very first saved, those passages had always bothered me. And I know that those are, are troubling to me for a number of reasons. And I guess, uh, you mean, you know, just give me 30 seconds here to explain to you why. I always had this difficulty trying to understand you know, what Jesus meant when he said, you know, Father, you know, if it is possible, may this cup pa t you know, pass from me. The reason I had trouble with that is that, um, I mean, I didn't understand how Jesus at so many other points could be telling his disciples, look, I'm going to die. Look, i got to go to the cross. When Peter says to Jesus, oh, Lord, you don't have to do it. He says, whoa, get behind me, Satan, man. You know, come on, dude. i got to do it this way. This is it. But then he comes to the garden, and all of a sudden he's asking God if there's another way. That always bothered me. You know, now, some people will explain that, you know, by saying that, well, that was Christ, you know, speaking this humanity. And as a man, you mean, he's saying, you mean, you know, you know, he's just confessing what's in his heart. But then, you mean, the God side of him takes over and says, but, you mean, you know, but you're, you know, not my will, but your will be done. Now, you mean, I have a little bit of a problem with that, because how can we separate? Did Jesus have two wills? Did he have, like, a human will that wanted to do one thing over there and a divine will that wanted to do one thing over there? I don't think we can do that to him. We kind of make him into a schizophrenic person. And I've studied this passage for a long time, and, I, and I've worked on it, you mean, and, and I, I have, you know, asked God about it, and I've talked to a lot of guys, and I've consulted a lot of people, and I'm going to be honest with you today, I still don't know. I still haven't been able to completely reconcile that passage. If you have something that works for you and you're comfortable with it, praise the Lord. But I've wrestled with that passage. I mean, and I, and I still am, and I'm still going to continue to study it as God kind of takes me through this, but this I know. Take a look at his words here. And Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? Isaiah, we're going to wrap it up. Isaiah 51. Turn over there. Isaiah 51. What is the cup? The cup is the cup of God's wrath. That much I think I know from Scripture. Very interesting passage here as we finish this up. Isaiah 51, 17. In this passage in Isaiah, Judah is basically, uh, you know, under God's chastisement. They're going to experience God's discipline. And when Babylon is finished disciplining Judah, God's people, then the Babylonians are going to suffer their own discipline at the hands of the Medes and the Persians. Now listen to this passage. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, the what? The cup of his wrath. You who have drained it to the dregs, the goblet that makes men stagger. Of all the sons she bore, there were none to guide her. Of all the sons she reared, there were none to take her by the hand. These double calamities have come upon you. Who can comfort you? Ruin and destruction, famine and sword, who can console you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like antelope caught in a net. They are filled with the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, hear this, you afflicted one, made drunk but not with wine. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger, and from that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. 
Put that context together with what Jesus says here. Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? Jesus knew that cup would be bitter. Peter wanted to get Jesus out of it. No, we can fight. No. There is only one purpose for me coming. Peter, the rest of you men, listen to me when I say this. Men, I have to go to the cross because it is the only way. I, the innocent one, I, the perfect son of God, must take your guilt and your sins. I must experience the wrath of God so that you would never have to. I will take the cup of God's wrath that you deserve, and I will drain it to its dregs. After that sacrifice is over, I know that God will remove that cup from me. And I will drink of it no more. What does Hebrews tell us? Christ suffered once for sin. My friends, the horror and the, and the difficulty of these passages leading up to Easter as we see what happened to the Lord was for a purpose. It was for our redemption. Christ accepted the wrath that we deserve. He paid the penalty for our sins. And that is the only way that we can be right with God by faith in what he did on that cross. He drank the cup for us. He experienced all that we would never have. My friends, that statement is at the very heart of the gospel itself. My question for you this morning as we close, do you know him? Do you know him? Have you ever opened your heart and faith to him and said, Lord, I know that what you did there on the cross was for me. I know all of this was following your plan. I know there was no other way. I know this isn't an accident of history. I know this was the plan from the infinite God. loving Savior who walked the path and marched the hill of Calvary. And I know why he came. I know he did it for me. To save me from my sin. All the things I've done wrong. Do you know him? Let's close in prayer. Father, thanks again for this time. Lord, they didn't arrest you in the garden. You gave yourself willing that you might bear our sins provide eternal life for us. Father, we, we have nothing but praise for all you've done. Lord, the list of things that I've done wrong is always before me. It's always in my mind and always in my heart. And Father, the wonder to think that the Lord Jesus took all those sins upon his body and marched them to the hill of Calvary. Father, there's nothing else to say but thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. We love you. Praise you.